Hello again, welcome back to GIT 335 Computer Systems Technology. Once again, I am your instructor, Nicholas Lindquist, and today we will be delving into personal technology. The future is you. And this is chapter seven in your textbook. Today our subjects include personal devices for improving productivity at school and work, and personal devices for enriching our leisure and our life. So as you can see here, the ongoing shift towards a more interactive and participatory web is exemplified by the concept of the mashup, which is a creative combination of content or elements from different sources, such as a web page that blends data from two or more sources to create new services or content. This corresponds uh, with the idea of, this is actually a few years old now, but uh, originally there was the web and companies would put their information on the web uh, for you and I and everyone else to see. And then Web 2.0 came along, which is the, uh, the web that each of us participates in creating. Uh, so now we're uploading all of our status updates and our tweets, and here's where we are, and here's what we're doing, and here's our photos, and here's this, that, and the other. So three trends in information technology continue to be, we've definitely touched on convergence at this point, portability and personalization should be uh, somewhat obvious, but we'll go through them anyway. As we have already said, convergence is the consolidation of different forms of media being compressed and consolidated into uh, two or three uh, media juggernauts. Uh, for right now, it kind of looks like smartphones are heading off to a, to a lead in that uh, everything that you used to be able to do exclusively at your computer or uh, at home watching television, you can now do on your smartphones. Um, pretty much everything can be done through your smartphone. So all of these different forms of media are converging and uh, consolidating into one new super form of media. And as you can see here, some of the pros are the increased convenience of our devices, which is a positive and a negative depending on your viewpoint, uh, becoming more affordable and they have more functions. Cons, however, would be uh, that the best example I can think of is uh, an old dinosaur right, like me remembers that uh, we used to have VCRs and then DVD players came out. Uh, and so the best at the time considered to buy was a DVD uh, VCR combo, which did both at the same time. But in reality, it did both of those features not quite as well as buying one or the other. And inevitably one would break before the other because neither was a higher quality and then you'd be left without uh, one at all. So uh, multiple features uh, compromise the quality of the primary feature that's being delivered. And then of course, as is the theme in this modern era, security risks are increasing in a big way also. The pros and cons of portabilities are, well, the pros are pretty obvious. For the most part, it is pretty cool to be able to call someone, text someone, access your files, your music, your photos, anywhere you are. Uh, but then on the other side of the coin, other times it's kind of annoying for other people to just reach out and touch you with their convenience. Wherever they are, any whim that crosses their minds, they can force that into your own already fractured consciousness by merely reaching out and uh, grabbing a hold of you, shaking you out of whatever you're trying to concentrate on at the moment. Uh, and so also the lack of face-to-face -face contact can lead to misinterpretations. Uh, especially if you've noticed uh, text messages in particular can be taken in any way uh, and are almost always interpreted in the most negative way possible. So it's important, especially in emails and text messages, to maintain a very happy, positive, upbeat uh, tone uh, in that you should probably assume that whoever is receiving those will probably put a negative spin on them in your mind. So it's good to have uh, very happy and pleasant text and email etiquette, right? Uh, and also there is the fear that we are completely learning how to interact socially as human beings with other human beings because rather than get up and walk down the office uh, to the other side of the office to tell something to your coworker, you just text them or email them instead. And so we're becoming less face to face and we're becoming more face to screen. Some of the pros to personalization are that we can do so, so many things very well and they're all personalized to us exclusively. We can download hundreds or thousands of songs um, we can have favorites or bookmarks of all of our favorite web pages, all of our favorite videos, so that they can be readily accessed. Uh, in addition, PC software can be used to create all kinds of personal projects, ranging from artwork to finances and genealogy. Uh, the, the downside to this is that computers and uh, smartphones and other devices are getting much, much, much better at wasting our time. Maybe you've noticed that that is the case. The higher level of possible productivity 
uh, higher level of fun as well. And so often we find ourselves reaching for our smartphones just to entertain away just a few minutes. Uh, and so there are pros and cons to personalization. We create them into our own personal fun boxes as well as our own personal um, productivity devices, don't we? Uh, and so here we talk about more of the cons. Um, as we said with a uh, multi-core processor, the uh, processor is really only doing one thing at a time. When you get down to it, it can only compute one thing at a time. It can just pretend that it's doing four or eight things. Uh, very, very, uh, it's just not doing them quite as well, not quite as efficiently. And we are the exact same way. Uh, multitasking just means that we are doing several things instead of one thing, not as effectively. So whenever you can, ladies and gentlemen, it's important to try to focus your mind, focus your consciousness on just one thing. Uh, fractured consciousness, I perfect per personally believe, is it's very, very bad. Uh, detrimental to uh, one person or our entire race. Uh, none of us can concentrate anymore. None of us can focus. All of our minds are so fractured and willy-nilly. Uh, and I think that smartphones are a large part of that. Uh, anyway, so multitasking is bad. Uh, if that's, that should be one of the things that you take away from this class. I feel very, very strongly about that. I think it's much more important to be engaged and present in what you're currently working on than worrying about five, ten things at once at the same time. One of my personal pet peeves is people who, when you're trying to focus on watching a movie or a television show or something like that, they're on their cell phone the entire time. That's a perfect example of multitasking, and that's just being like a glutton uh, for media consumption, if you ask me. Anyway, I don't want to get on my soapbox. So also we have these things uh, this, uh, because we have so many opportunities um, and possibilities at our, as our fingertips. Uh, we can get this uh, phenomenon known as analysis paralysis where we don't do anything because we can't decide from all the different possible choices. As you know, with the World Wide Web at our fingertips, there's a hundred different options for everything that we're interested in investigating, interested in purchasing, and the number of choices can be overwhelming. And so we shut down and we do nothing. And then so the next one you see here, regret about choices. Well, even when we do finally manage to decide on something, then we can beat ourselves up for not potentially cho choosing the best of those choices. Uh, and of course, we don't deserve that. We're just human beings, right? Uh, analysis paralysis ties into inactions. Uh, excessive expectations, having the entire world at our fingertips, we expect perfection. And then of course, inevitably there's a letdown when that product or service or even ourselves fail to deliver that perfect um, idea that we had at the outset. Uh, paralysis from too many choices, filtering. Facts are facts. News should reflect the world, not us. Okay, getting into smartphones, uh, which are basically computers with the ability to make phone calls, aren't they? So a smartphone is a cell phone with a microprocessor, memory, display screen, modem, apps, and internet access. Uh, you should be familiar with all those terms now. A smartphone allows for phone calls, email, web browsing, music availability, text messaging, video games, digital TV viewing, search tools, GPS, personal information management, and so on and so forth. It's really pretty impressive, isn't it, to think that just five or ten years ago, I would say maybe it was about ten years ago, I had a dippy little, little red phone. And uh, it may or may not have even had a camera, like maybe a ten total pixel camera or something like that, you know. And at the time, that was pretty cool. Just everyone had a little flip phone. And then I remember my first friend who text messaged me. We were on our way to a movie, and I got my first text message that said, we're in this row or something like that. And I thought, oh my god, that's just great. That is so cool. And now, flash forward to 10 years later, I could not be more sick of text messaging. Seriously, if I never receive another text message, I'll be a happy man. So maybe I'm not the only one who, who's getting thoroughly disgusted with the, um, the technology these days. I would prefer to just read a book, personally. Uh, anyway, I'm getting carried away. But however, we cannot deny the value of being in a store, for example, and doing some comparison shopping on your cell phone. We cannot deny, for myself, I would be lost every time I got in the car to go somewhere new if I didn't have my Apple Map or Google Map app running. It's interesting when you talk to like a dinosaur on the phone and they start getting really intent like, okay, you need to pay attention because you're going to make a right here and then a left here and then you're going to have to worry about this. And it's like, look, dude, just give me the address and I'll be there. Uh, so, smartphones, again, changing the way we do everything, and a lot of old people haven't caught up. Uh, storage, as we said before, um, non-volatile memory would be the type of memory that's stored on a flash memory card or on a hard drive, in that that memory is safe and secure and it does not disappear when the phone is turned off. However, when you talk about RAM, and phones do have RAM these days, uh, we're talking about volatile memory in which the, the memory is wiped every time it loses power. 
Text messaging, as we said, is the sending of short messages, generally no more than 160 characters in length, including spaces, to a smartphone or other handheld device. Uh, this is sort of like a, uh, an email, right? Uh, a brief email that uh, immediately goes directly to someone's handheld device. It's uh, even more convenient than email, isn't it really? It's just reaching out and bzz, buzzing someone. Um, so obviously I don't need to tell you about text messaging. Everybody, even your dog, is familiar with how text messaging works at this point. And so, of course, clearly we have some positive and negative effects of cell phone usage, many of which I'm sure we have not even begun to discover yet in this day and age. Some of the positive effects are parents can more easily monitor their children or overbearing wives and husbands can more easily monitor the whereabouts of their wives and husbands, which is, you know, good and bad. Police dispatchers can more easily help find people who are lost. Information and amusements are readily available. Clearly, we know that's the case. Getting road assistance is, is excellent. We can't deny that these are very, very great features of this new smartphone technology. And we can get out information more quickly during emergencies. I know there's a Twitter uh, account that you can subscribe to called ASU Alert, where when anything's going on, um, any kind of um, emergency, uh, anything like that, ASU Alerts doo -doo -doo, sends out a tweet, stay away from this building, uh, this is going on, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then, of course, there's negative effects of cell phones. I'm sure we're all very familiar with a lot of these negative effects and that other people on cell phones are annoying. I mean, can we just call a spade a spade here? How many of us are annoyed when we see people talking on cell phones in public and then we turn around and answer phone calls and do the exact same thing? Perhaps a little hypocritical of us, but yes, it is true that people around us in public on cell phones are annoying. And it really makes me sad for our entire race in general when I walk into a place and I see, what really makes me sad is when I see a couple going out to dinner and both of them are staring at their cell phones. Or even more sad, when an entire family is sitting down and everyone's staring at their cell phones. Guys, that's not, that's not okay. As human beings, we should not be doing that. I feel strongly, if you're out with someone you love and you care about, put, put down your cell phone. There is no way what's happening on Facebook or whatever it may be could possibly be as interesting as face-to-face -face contact with that real person that you have sitting in front of you. So please, 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 put down your cell phone. That's my message for this lecture. Put it down, preferably while you're going over a bridge. Whoosh. No, I'm just kidding. Um, obviously, it's a love-hate relationship I have with my cell phone. I personally would like to um, simplify my own life. And it's, uh, I read somewhere that um, the more profoundly useful and helpful a technology is, the more profoundly we become its slave. Uh, I remember one time one of my coworkers said, if you want to get a raise here, you're going to have to sleep with your cell phone underneath your pillow so that people can call you all night long. Uh, and frankly, I just wasn't willing to do that. So some people are, some people aren't. Uh, anyway, tablets and e-readers. Oh, such, fun, such interesting and fun devices, aren't they? So a tablet is a general purpose computer contained within a single panel. A uh, perfect example would be like an iPad. Uh, even if you're not talking about an Apple tablet, people will often call them iPads. Uh, we can also see here there are Android tablets and Windows RT tablets as well. It seems like those uh, Windows or Microsoft Surface are finally uh, catching up to uh, Apple iPads. I gotta admit, I think it's pretty slick that you can use all of your full-size apps. Um, on the Microsoft Surface. That is one thing about Apple iPads and smartphones. It seems inevitable to me that at some point all of our computing will be done on, you know, at least everything that doesn't require huge monitors for video editing or, or graphics or something like that. It does seem like our smartphones, are, 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 uh, our tablets are going to become full-fledged computers and we'll use them for all those purposes. Uh, but in order for that to happen, full-size apps will eventually have to make their way onto tablets and e-readers, um, tablets and smartphones. Uh, and with Microsoft Surface, that is finally possible. Uh, so good for Microsoft. They're, they're ahead, I think, in that respect. I think it's inevitable that the Mac OS uh, and iOS will keep becoming more and more like each other until they are, well, basically they are the same product that it's installed on a Macintosh or on a phone, depending on which one you may happen to have. However, for the immediate moment, we're discussing the difference between e-readers and tablets. So e-readers are specific devices that uh, are much, 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 much better at being digital books. However, they are not nearly quite as good as being computers or tablets. 
So some of the benefits of e-readers are that uh, they use much, 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 much less battery life and their screens are much easier to look at. And because they are exclusively uh, geared towards reading books, they are much, much, much better for that purpose. And they're much less expensive also. So if you're trying to decide if you're going to buy a tablet predominantly to read books, you're better off getting an e-reader. Uh, for those reasons, a tablet will be heavier um, because the backlit display uh, an e-reader uses a special magnetic type of ink to where when you turn to a new page, it uses the magnets to create whatever that substance is, iron oxide or something inside of the screen, uh, to lay that out uh, using positive and negative magnetic charges um, as text on the screen. And there it stays until you turn the page. However, a, um, a tablet uses backlit energy that it takes much, much, much more energy uh, to keep the screen lit all the time. And for that reason, you could probably get six, seven, eight hours out of your tablet, whereas you can get um, 30, 40 days from an e-reader. You may have also noticed, though, that um, e-readers aren't backlit, uh, so the good ones do come with lights, so you can see what's on the screen, even in the dark. Some other uh, positives that I didn't immediately point out. Uh, E-reader can store hundreds or thousands of books. These files are very, very small. They're typically .epub files, uh, and they're a fancy version of text files. Uh, easy to download, type size and face can be adjusted, can be read in low light, it says. Uh, and then some other benefits there as well. Uh, as we just talked about, an e-reader uses e-ink, which is composed of millions of tiny particles that use magnetic charges to display text on the screen. Some drawbacks of e-readers. Uh, there are also some considerable drawbacks in that uh, they don't render photos very well or images at all. That's one of the reason that um, textbooks are not porting very well to e-readers because it's virtually impossible to represent those images on an e-reader in a high quality understandable format. Uh, some of the other drawbacks, the ones that are really kind of frustrating, are that you don't actually, the prices are the exact same for the physical um, uh, paper and ink books, however, you don't actually own them. And there have actually been cases of those e-books just disappearing off your shelves for whatever reasons. You don't actually own the license and they can just go in and take those books off your shelf, which is the equivalent of you know Barnes & Noble walking into your house and taking one of your books because you only own the license to it. And it's the same price, so there should be a way you should be able to trade books with people, I think. Um, and there can be some kind of digital glitch and you can lose your books just like that. So the technology is not quite perfect yet. Portable media players, or pimps, you can't make this up folks, are portable devices that play digital audio, video, and or image files. And the iPod is a perfect example of this. Um, someone has already, uh, in fact many people have, have defined the iPod as the game-changing device for our generation uh, in that it's rather like the Sony Walkman. It just completely changed um, the face of uh, entertainment. Uh, MP3 is the format, the standard format of digital uh, video or digital audio files in that uh, they're small enough to, you can have all sorts of them on your um, portable, portable media player or iPod. The sound quality is very good and they don't take up much, much space. So they're kind of the perfect uh, mix. Uh, they'd be the center part of that Venn diagram uh, in terms of um, taking up space and in terms of sound quality. So that's why an MP3 is so common. Moving on to digital cameras. Uh, digital cameras are another very interesting technology. As it says here, uh, video and photographs are taken digitally and easily by the digital camera using an electronic image sen sensor. Uh, so as you may or may not be aware, uh, film itself is pretty much gone except for those hobbyist enthusiasts who still enjoy the sensation of shooting onto film. Um, maybe you're too young to remember this, but it used to be that we would have cameras that would have about 24, maybe 36 shots on them. Uh, and you'd want to be very careful not to waste those shots uh, because, well, if you did, well, they just wouldn't come out. So it would be kind of like we'd have disposable cameras with 24 photos, and then once it was done, you'd take it to um, the Walmart or the Walgreens or whatever, the drugstore, uh, and you'd have your pictures developed, and chances are there may be one, maybe two, maybe three of those would actually be decent usable fixtures. Now, however, we have uh, digital cameras on our phone in which we take millions and millions and millions of pictures, right? Uh, I was reading in the textbook, I think it said there's 350 million photos uploaded to Facebook each day, which is absolutely crazy. 350 million photos uploaded to Facebook each day. So we are taking many, 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 many more photos than we used to, 
uh, and we are sharing those at a ridiculous, ridiculous rate too. Uh, so here's some different types of digital cameras. So the, um, the mark of how high image quality is on the digital camera is in its megapixel rating. So as we discussed earlier in a previous chapter, the more pixels on the screen, the more dots per inch in terms of printing, the higher quality that image is. So the more pixels, the more pixel, pixel data in each picture, the higher the resolution, the more rich, the more depth, the, um, the color field that you see, and the better the image looks. And as you can well imagine, the more space that is taken up by the digital file also. So the higher rate of megapixel for a digital camera, uh, the better off the quality will be. So as you can well imagine, the uh, camera on your iPhone or Blackberry or um, Android phone uh, isn't going to be nearly, nearly, nearly as good as one of those prosumer cameras that you might buy for 100, maybe 200 bucks. The camera will be significantly, significantly better on one of those. However, with the convenience of having a camera with you everywhere you go, uh, both are extremely useful technologies. And as we say here, digital zoom is a faked version of zoom in that uh, maybe you've noticed in my own life, I've noticed that on my iPhone, when I want to zoom into something, it gets closer, but the quality does not get better. Uh, so all it does really is just crop out portions of that image for me. It makes it look like it's better, but really it's, it's not. So um, contrast that with the optical zoom, which is a literal moving of the, um, the lens of the camera closer to the subject. That is a real legitimate zoom in that it doesn't just uh, zoom in and cro crop away pixels. Uh, so another reason those prosumer cameras are even better are more valuable and more useful is you can actually zoom in and get closer to your subject. And storage size for digital pictures. Uh, maybe you remember when the first digital cameras came out, 64 megabits was a considerable, 64 megabytes was a considerable amount of space on one of those little SD cards and sometimes you still come across those and you say, oh my God, how cute, 64 megabits, oh my God, it's adorable. Megabytes, uh, of course, now even 512 megabytes is very small. So we would have the, um, the SD card that I currently have in the camera recording this is 16 gigabytes. And the size of these video files is so much that about two hours worth of footage, this is only good for 90 minutes, and it'll fill up 32 gigabytes. So I have to be very quick in that um, these files are getting so much bigger. So I'm actually currently shooting in HD, which is uh, 16 by 9, and I believe it's uh, 1920 by 1080 is the pixel dimensions. So I'm shooting in the very, very highest quality possible. Uh, so as you can imagine, these files get very, very, very large very, very, very quickly. Uh, so, as you can see there, 64 megabytes is, is very small. 512 megabytes is very, very small. Uh, and so the amount of the, um, the storage space that we need goes up just as fast as the, uh, the quality of the cameras gets as well. It's interesting, isn't it? The computers get faster and faster and faster uh, in terms of their speed. But do they really ever get faster? Our experience using them never really seems to change, does it? You press the button, you wait about the same amount of time for the computer to start up. You try to launch the application, it takes the same amount of time as it ever did, right? But supposedly the computer is faster. What's up with that? Anyway, moving on, as we talked briefly about startup time um, for a digital camera, that is very, very important if you just happen to see um, a giant bunny rabbit, which I have seen before, freakishly large bunny rabbits out by my house. My wife doesn't believe that they exist, but if I had a digital camera with very, very smart, very, very fast startup time, like one, maybe two seconds, bam, I might be able to someday photograph one of those elusive giant bunny rabbits. Uh, so that's very important if you're going to shell out for a digital camera. Make sure it can st start up very quickly so you can start immediately taking those pictures. Uh, and then battery life, also a consideration. Uh, principal methods for transferring images from your digital camera and to, onto your computer. Um, consult your owner's manual. Nothing too tricky about that. Societal effects of digital cameras. This is actually a little bit creepy uh, in that if you've ever been out in public and thought to yourself, my God, is that person taking a picture of me? And then you look and then they kind of turn away. Uh, you know, maybe I'm just paranoid, but I could swear that actually seems to happen. I'm not a celebrity by any means, um, but it's awkward to think that we live in a society now where anybody could be taking pictures of you all the time and you would never even realize. Uh, one of the considerations for Google Glass, the, um, the glasses that Google have that uh, has the built-in camera, they actually had to add uh, a sound that you can't turn off so that every time it takes a picture, which is when you wink, it takes a picture, it makes a sound so that anyone around you knows that a picture is being taken and you can't turn that off because otherwise you could be just a creepy McWeirdo, you know, on the, on the elevator or whatever, just uh, winking at some girl behind your glasses. 
so anyway, um, societal effects of digital cameras, uh, more people snapping pictures of everything. We have less uh, privacy in the world. As you say here, it can be intrusive and even illegal, voyeurism. I tell you what, that guy in the slide certainly looks like he's a little bit creepy and weird. Up to something intrusive and illegal for sure. High-tech radio, almost through here. Satellite radio, uh, maybe you're familiar, familiar with Sirius or XM. Uh, it is a, a distribution method of radio in that you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of choices and rather than using terrestrial radio, it uses satellites in orbit uh, in the atmosphere of our fine planet to um, send those signals around and give you uh, many, many more channels to choose from. Uh, the primary provider is Sirius XM, which those used to be two different uh, companies, uh, and then they merged into one. So if you really, really like your satellite radio, maybe you really like your, um, your Howard Stern, uh, maybe you just don't like commercials, maybe you want access to four or five different flavors of heavy metal, which, who could fault you for that? Satellite radio might be worth investigating. And then we have hybrid radio, uh, which is a slight upgrade over uh, the analog radio from the past in that they can now squeeze two digital channels to go along with it. So we have one channel of analog, which is uh, the audio that we're used to. Maybe you've noticed uh, that riding in your car, sometimes you'll see the name of the uh, artist or the name of the song start scrolling uh, on the, the faceplate of your radio and you'll say, how on earth could it possibly know that? Well, this is due to hybrid digital radio and that it sends that digital signal at the same time that allows it to define um, to label uh, the song that you're actually listening to. So they can send more information through the air than just the analog sound. Uh, internet radio would be like iTunes radio or something like that. Uh, Last FM, Pandora, uh, something like that. Podcasting was absolutely huge for a while, about the same time that iPods were absolutely blowing up. Uh, and people still do podcast, and they are still very useful. Uh, so basically what this is, is people can record uh, either short little videos or uh, short little audio segments and upload them to uh, iTunes or whatever. Um, iTunes U is a place for educational podcasts that you can go and Stanford and Harvard and all these other colleges have free educational, excuse me, podcasts that you can download in the format of MP3s, M4Vs, uh, MPEG4s or something like that. And it's intended that you put them onto your uh, iPod, um, iPhone, whatever it may be, and then you have them with you to listen to at any time. So what makes podcasting unique is that, uh, as it says here, special receiving software called an aggregator is necessary. So you just subscribe to the things you're interested in, and then you can cont control the flow, but the podcasts that you're interested in automatically appear in your inbox, your, um, your aggregator mailbox, in your iTunes, or wherever it may be, the podcasts that you have subscribed in um, they automatically appear for you. And then you can control those to say, I don't want to see these anymore, or whatever. But it's actually very, very useful. I very much enjoy for car trips or whatever, when you don't want to just listen to the radio, you can download full podcasts of all sorts of different uh, topics. Digital television. So there's some different flavors of digital television. Uh, interactive TV, it kind of reminds me of, I remember when I was younger, there was this thing they tried to push called smell vision on TV. Believe it or not, it was really true. And it was some kind of device that um, you would pick up somewhere that would go along with what was being broadcast on Fox. And so it was like married with children, and like whenever they would make a joke about Al's socks or something like that, the smell uh, would somehow come out of whatever this device was. So it's kind of like that, uh, smell vision I mean, I only remember seeing that for a few months, but uh, just kind of a horrifying um, but at the time, kind of interesting technology, you know? So this is kind of like that. Interactive TV lets you interact with the show you're watching. Uh, nowadays, uh, rather than smell o vision it might actually be more like uh, voting on American Idol or something like that. Uh, built in to the TV program that you're watching is the um, opportunity to interact with it. Most likely uh, voting, saying I do or don't like this. Internet TV is different. Uh, for myself, I don't even have cable at home, and it's liberating. I feel great about it. Um, people ask me all the time, what do you think of this movie that's coming out? I have no idea what you're talking about. What do you think of this show that's on TV? I have no idea what you're talking about. It's great. What do you think of this commercial? I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. I have internet TV at home, and I utilize that relentlessly. I've got my Netflix. I go to mvc.com. I go to a and I go to Hulu. There's actually Amazon on delivery now. 
Uh, if you're paying for cable, I have to question your judgment. It seems like a gross uh, waste of money to me. Now remember, let's go back to that concept of convergence, where everything is eventually coming back to internet delivery, uh, basically. And so if you're still paying for a cable distribution of all of those hundreds of channels that you probably only like about 5% of, I would consider maybe paring down that cable bill and considering looking at the internet TV options instead. Connect a computer to your giant home TV, um, your giant home TV and you can actually save a lot of money each month while still getting your entertainment. Uh, it's what I do, it's a lot of other people are doing that, so you might want to consider that. Uh, anyway, so internet ready TV uh, would be a TV that is maybe connected with a wire, uh, wireless or a wired ethernet connection. Uh, and so should you choose to, you can pause the, uh, the TV show that you're watching and then open up your browser and do some research. Uh, so it's uh, a TV also has internet access. Three types of digital television broadcasting. So once again, I'm very old. Uh, and from the years 1997 to 2001, I was working at PBS. Uh, I worked in television for four years. Putting shows online, uh, controlling the camera, uh, yes, controlling the cameras, controlling the tapes. Uh, so anyway, I remember back when TV was analog, and then there was this huge DTV push, maybe you remember, and it said by 2009, was it 2009? Yeah, they gave us 10 years, and they said everything that's online has to be digital, so it's time to start getting up your, your stuff up to code right now. And so all of our old analog, which is, you know, like huge reel-to-reel -reel tapes that we would use to down, or to, um, from the satellites, record the shows on our giant tapes, and then the commercials would be on very, very small tapes. Uh, all those tapes eventually went away, and so they gave us 10 years to get digital broadcasting equipment in place, because obviously digital equipment has a very much higher quality to it, and it's easier to get the signal from one place to another. So that's what digital sig television is. Uh, it uses a digital signal, not analog. Maybe, if you're as old as me, you'll remember seeing some analog um, Broadcasting problems that don't really happen anymore. Maybe you've seen um, a tape melt on midair. Uh, maybe you've seen, uh, we used to call them head clogs, which is uh, something gets into the into the, the spiels of the tape and then it'll just stop working and it'll look like you know, look like analog death on the screen. Uh, so digital is different, obviously. Then we have high definition television, which works with the current digital broadcasting signals. It uses a lot of bandwidth because it sends uh, a higher level of pixels and more image and uh, audio data. It's higher resolution than analog and so it uses more bandwidth. And then we have standard definition television. Uh, as we said before, digital TV has much, much higher uh, number of pixels and scanning lines on the screen, uh, so it takes up a lot more space. So for that reason, you can actually multicast up to five standard definition television uh, programs using the same amount of bandwidth that uh, HDTV uses. So stations like, I don't know, Nick at Night or something where they're using the old I Love Lucy SDTV, they can broadcast up to five of those at the same time in the same amount that it takes to, um, to broadcast a new episode of Blacklist or something, for example. Societal effects of digital TV. Maybe you have already witnessed family members, children becoming TV monsters. My brother used to be a TV monster and he still is. Uh, some people just get uh, obsessed with that whole video on demand. They get obsessed with their shows. They get obsessed with being able to skip over the commercials. These are all nice things. One of my coworkers actually has two TiVos because for him it wasn't enough to be able to record four shows at a time. There were often times that he wanted to record five or six shows at the same time. Uh, and so he has a secondary TiVo now just to make sure, just in case the first one uh, doesn't quite do the job for him. He's got a backup TiVo. Oh boy, video games. Oh boy, oh boy. Everyone likes video games, right? Well, I certainly do. Um, I don't actually play them. I don't have time for video games, but I really like them as an idea. I think video games are cool. Uh, so video game consoles, in that if you remember when I was a kid, I had the NES. It was 8-bit. I remember it was just coming out when I was in third or fourth grade, and we just all lost our minds for NES. So I guess technically you could say it was a computer, but uh, the modern um, consoles are much, much, much more computer-like in that you could do all the same computer functions on an Xbox One, many of the same computer functions, or a PlayStation 4. They're all online. You can do all sorts of, you can watch Netflix, you know, I'm sure you could, there's probably Facebook apps, whatever. These things are becoming fully-fledged computers in their own right. Uh, and as it says there, they might be the ultimate convergence machine, which I could definitely see that. I could definitely see them being the one in one uh, like the one ring, the one future standard for delivery of media. Uh, I, there are some considerations though, uh, a little bit scary stuff uh, with those video consoles. 
So I'm sure you're probably familiar. If you own an Xbox One, uh, a little bit creepy. It has to be online all the time in order for you to do anything, which is a little bit awkward. Why is that necessary? You should be able to play a video game without your Xbox being online, I think. Perhaps even more strange is that the Kinect, the, 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 the camera, has to be on at all times, and it has to detect someone in the room in order to play. So there's a camera, a really, really good camera, watching you at all the time, and it won't even play unless it can watch you. That's a little bit strange to me, especially when you consider that there are actually viruses for your Xbox. Your Xbox can get viruses, and it's very, very easy for hackers to get into your Kinect and watch you all the time. So be aware, be aware, with technology there are new threats that we have to worry about. Uh, continual um, threats to our privacy, uh, so be careful, be very careful out there. Um, so take these things into consideration when purchasing your next uh, Xbox or PlayStation video game console. All right, folks, I won't take up any more of your time this fine afternoon. Thank you for uh, staying tuned and watching the personal technology. The future is you, Chapter 7 lecture for GIT 335. Once again, I am your instructor, Nicholas Lindquist, bidding you adieu, and I will see you online.